Good morning. I'm pleased to welcome you to what I believe is the 11th Ethics and Leadership Panel. I'm Jennifer Asselstein, the Undergraduate Director here at the School of Architecture, and I'm extremely excited to introduce today's topic, Youth Inclusion in Building Spaces and our Experience Panel. As engagement with our local communities has grown in the last several years through the studio and course curriculums of Samina Satopkin, Daron Serban, Julia Grinkrug, Eowana Harrison, and other committed faculty, and through the efforts of our AIAS chapter, our architecture students have found themselves working with the youth at Hunters Point and Bayview neighborhoods and finding out firsthand the satisfaction, the responsibilities, and the challenges of this leadership role. When I introduced our students to the panelists' experience in a dialogue to collect questions, to collect their questions, I received the most attentive interest and a longer list of questions than in any of the previous 10 events. So therefore, it's clear to me that this topic is something that you and the next generation of architects can relate to from your current and previous experiences. Both Prescott Rivas and Emily Pulliton, our panelists today, bring here today over 25 years of, ex of combined experience in guiding youth ages elementary school through high school towards discovering their confidence, their passions, and their skills through design and construction of the built environment. Prescott Rivas is an Oakland-based spatial activist, a designer, planner, an award-winning educator who has merged 20 years of experiences in architecture, planning, and education to develop and construct inclusive communities internationally with a focus on equitable design and planning justice. Prescott is a founder and director of Anomaly Design and Planning, providing community engagement, planning, design advocacy, and design education services for nonprofits, small businesses, and community-based organizations. Projects including planning community engagement and design for the Oakland Black Cultural Zone, the BCZ Hub, as well as youth engagement, planning, and design with Woodlawn and Richmond Verde Elementary Schools. Mr. Rivas's previous experience includes serving as the Director of Community Planning and Project Manager for the nonprofit AND Architecture and Community Planning in San Francisco. Prescott's completed projects include, in, include the design for Urban Ed Academy Headquarters, SOMA Asset Mapping Youth and Family Zone, several community clinics for San Francisco Department of Public Health, and the Hunters Point Community Youth Park, Youth Master Plan. Before AND, Mr. Ravis was an associate and director of student internships for the internationally acclaimed design firm Anshin and Allen, now known as Stantec, where he focused on healthcare and academic projects for 13 years. His completed projects include UC Berkeley, UC include buildings for UC Berkeley, UC Santa Cruz, University of Missouri, and Santa Clara County Medical Facilities. Mr. Rivas is an experienced youth educator having taught over 15 years with students from elementary school through high school on architecture, planning, culture, and sustainability. He has served as the co-chair of the AIA San Francisco Mentorship Committee, a founding member of the San Francisco chapter of National Organization of Minority Architects, SF NOMA, the vice president of SF NOMA, and the NOMA University Liaison for the West the chair of the NOMA National Student Competition, and chair of NOMA's Project Pipeline, which I hope we'll hear more about. Presently, Mr. Ravis is a Youth Plan Learn Action Now, Y Plan consultant, and he was named the Y Plan Hero from UC Berkeley Center for Cities and Schools for his work with Malcolm X Academy in the Hunters Point neighborhood of San Francisco over the last 10 years. He's a mentor awardee by the AIASF. He has served as a teaching artist with Youth Art, Youth Art Exchange and as a founder and current director of Project Pipeline Community Planning and Action and Community Planning and Architecture Camp in San Francisco. He's accredited in sustainable design, certified in social economic environmental design, and has completed his architecture registration exams. He earned his Bachelor of Architecture with a minor in education from Howard University, where he was honored with the Alpha Rho Chi Medal for his dedication to youth education and mentoring in the DC community. Prescott has, received, has completed certificates and applications in technology in planning and community design and development at San Jose State University. What I want to say is the word educator, mentor, and activist is sprinkled so much throughout that. I'm very excited to see Prescott here today. 
Emily is a designer, builder, educator, and founder of the nonprofit Project H Design and its sister program, Girls Garage. Using architecture and design as a vehicle to transform communities and classroom pedagogy, she works alongside youth ages 9 to 18 to co-design and build public architecture projects. She has built a farmer's market with high school students, a playhouse with girls whose mothers have experienced domestic violence, a school library designed by its own middle school students, and micro-homes for a homeless housing agency. Her work seeks to change the authorship of our built environment and cultivate power in underestimated communities, specifically young girls, undocumented youth, and communities of color. With, with an educational philosophy rooted in creativity, design thinking, and project-based learning, Emily also works with educators in schools to reinvent teaching and learning in more hands-on and community-focused ways. Emily holds a Bachelor of Arts in Architecture from the University of California, Berkeley, and a Master of Fine Arts in Architecture, Interior Architecture, and Designed Objects from the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. She is cur currently a lecturer in the College of Environmental Design at the University of California, Berkeley, and is the author of three books, including her forthcoming book about tools and building for young women. Her work is documented in the full-length film, If You Build It, and has been featured on the TED stage, the New York Times, the Colbert Report, and, present, and presented to the Obama Administration's Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House. Our moderator today is Mimi Sullivan, the Executive Director of the School of Architecture. Mimi's 28 years of diverse architectural and interior design experience includes extensive work in award-winning multifamily mixed-use transit-oriented housing, as well as commercial retail, civic building design, and custom single-family homes. Ms. Sullivan's work in affordable housing has been published in Architectural Record as well as in the San Francisco AIA magazine, Small Firms, Great Projects. She's both an architect and an educator. She has taught architectural design, media, and process at universities in the United States and in Japan. She's the founding director of this School of Architecture here at the Academy of Art University. Mimi has introduced our studios to the extensive renovation at Hunters Point East West Development Affordable Housing, which paved the way for our first School of Architecture design build, completed in spring of 2018. Prior to starting Saida Sullivan Design Partners in 1999 with her partner, Ms. Sullivan was teaching Japanese architectural history at Waseda University in Tokyo. Japan while acting as the resident director of the Oregon State System of Higher Education for the study abroad programs at multiple universities in Tokyo. Ms. Sullivan received a Bachelor of Arts in Architecture from Rice University with a minor in Fine Arts and a Master of Architecture and Master of International Studies from the University of Oregon. <sighs> Thank you for all three of you for your participation today. The sequence of the day is to give each presenter time to introduce their background and current projects and then Mimi Sullivan will facilitate a discussion followed by an open Q&A from both our on-site and our online audiences. I'd like to now present Prescott Rivas. One thing I had to make sure I do, I will stand up here and talk all day if you give me, so I have to time myself to make sure I stay within the parameters which is a very important thing for all, the, all we do. Um, first of all, thank you for having me this morning. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, first of all, I think it's amazing that so many students are here that want to hear about this work, because I believe it is absolutely imperative that we engage our young people with the process of architecture and planning. Um, but more importantly, I think it will really help you to understand of how to actually create more joy in the projects that we do, because that's one thing we don't have in the world is enough joy every day. And the people that are experts are that are kids. So, um, so first off, it's always important for me to kind of give a framework exactly of who I am and kind of where do I come from. And it really stems from my, from my, from my, from my family. Um, and these are the three probably most important people in my family. Um, so on the left is my mother, who was an artist an art teacher and also a founder of a drop-in art center in the area I grew up in, in upstate New York. Uh, the woman in the back who looks like a goddess is my favorite aunt, Aunt Ramona, 
who was also a teacher, she was a librarian, but really her important role in my life was that she basically cultivated anything I had an interest in. She was the only uh, aunt that we had on both sides of the family that was never married, so all the nieces and nephews were like her kids. We used to have parties at her house in Brooklyn where like, you know, she'd have like 17 different nieces and nephews over hanging out there. And she was kind of the it girl. You know, back in the, in the in the 50s and 60s, she was a socialite in, in Brooklyn, hung out with a lot of artists, activists. So she imparted a lot of kind of the philosophy of how I look at life, you know, about being connected to community, but more importantly, always being a larger voice for community for those who don't have a voice. And then my father, who was also an educator, um, who ran everything from being an elementary school teacher, a principal, a guidance counselor, to being a director of creating the equal opportunity programs for the State University of New York system, which essentially allows for minorities to go to school and basically have all the support systems they need to actually to matriculate through college. So you can see I had a lot of great people that really influenced me without even me knowing it until I kind of got older. And I will say I fought teaching pretty much until I got into college because like, oh, no, I don't want to do that. I see everybody do that. I'm not interested in that. But once I got into it and I saw the value of actually being a teacher, which really is not about what I'm imparting to people, but more importantly, what I'm getting back from students and the information they can provide me about what I'm not understanding. Um, and of course, a picture of me. But how did I get really interested in this work? It, and I found this, and my mom had saved the book from when I was in middle school, and there was something I wrote in there of, of how, why I was interested in these things, which I didn't even know this. I don't even remember this. Um, and then just kind of, kind of some pictures down at the bottom to kind of show you my journey of becoming an architect and working with people, you know. The picture on the left is me in Lincoln, Nebraska, where I went, I was a big time track runner when I was younger at the Junior Olympics. That's the second picture I think is my second or third year in architecture school. The third picture over is my first building that I actually got to do construction administration on, which was for a renovation of a lab building in, in, on Berkeley. And then, of course, you always got to have your seminal picture of any architect standing in a great building looking in the middle of nowhere. It's like you got to have a picture like that. You're not a true architect when you have some building like that, picture like that. Um, so kind of my journey, which kind of went really quick, it's supposed to time through there, but I guess it's not working right. But it's basically to kind of talk about, you know, this is what it experienced, you know. So I went to school at Howard University in Washington, D.C. Then I moved out to Oregon, worked there for a while, then came down here, worked for Stantec, worked for A&D. But you know, the really idea of when I started working for A&D is really kind of where I started thinking myself less of an architect and really more about a spatial activist. And I'll kind of get into that later. And that's where I really started thinking less about how does an architect play a role of actually leading community, but really being an architect that really is the voice of the community, which is a big shift and change in mentality of how you think about how you operate. Um, so, you know, the first program actually I introduced to actually working with young people is when it was my third year in, at Howard and working with the National Building Museum. So they had a program called City Vision that was a 16-week program that we worked with a group of middle school students to actually come up with a project they wanted to do within their neighborhood to improve their neighborhood. But we also had to do surveys through the entire city to kind of understand what was happening in their neighborhoods so they could identify what were things they really want in their neighborhood. Then the second one, when I moved to Oregon, was working with the Architectural Heritage Center Bosco Middleton Foundation, which was developing a program called Homeworks, where we worked with middle school and elementary school students by using architecture and community oral history of visiting neighbors to teach them about their, their neighborhood. So all these were really impactful programs or for me understanding of kind of what are the benefits of working with young people in the process of kind of talking about how cities are created, but more importantly, how do they view them and how do they view that they can be improved? Um, so, you know, over like in the last seven or eight years as I moved forward this, you know, I really wanted to understand how does this actually play a role in kind of globally? And so when I really started diving into this, a lot of people don't know this, but there's actually an initiative that's nationally called the Child Friendly Cities. And it's basically this process is really thinking about how do you engage young people on creating them to be, become more active citizens in creating their cities. Um, and so it's really priority is really about helping to think about how do you think about the more civic um, members and less about kind of about really about architecture and design, but how do they become people that understand how cities work, government works, and really how they can already help at whatever age they are to help to improve that. So why is this important? There's roughly 7.7 .7 billion people in the world. 
of that 2.6 billion are youth. So that means basically 34% of the world is made up of young people. So if you're particularly working on public projects and you're not engaging young people, you're failing, right? If you got a, if you got a 66 on an exam, if you got a 66 on, a, on, on, on your design review, is that good work? No. So that means the majority of work that we're doing within, within our public realm is not adequate because we're not actually engaging all of our community. So that's why this work is extremely important when we really think about it from a public realm and public, public works and public access perspective. And so when we think about the public realm, the public realm at one time was a place that people actually played in. It was a place of activity, a place where people felt comfortable. That doesn't really exist too much anymore. It was actually a place where people felt safe to actually engage with, with, with the law enforcement. And when we think about where we are right now, this is not the norm. So how do we start to get back to that? How do we start to do that? So that's what the Child Friendly Cities Initiative started doing in, in 1996. As part of as UNICEF, they actually started really looking about, when we look around the world, how do we actually, actually improve the world? They really thought about that we need to engage young people more. And so it's really talking, once again, about this idea of how do you actually engage young people as being authentic citizens and participating in a very significant way. Now, this originally was intended specifically more for third world countries, which is kind of funny, but it's really more applicable to first world countries because that's where most of the issues are, really thinking about how do we engage our young people. So, as I told you before, I really think of myself really about being more of a spatial activist. And so what does that mean? It's really a person that's really, that, that advocates and produces projects that focuses on justice, equity, and access to quality spaces and services for underserved communities and under-resourced communities. So that's a really different way of thinking about how do you activate your, your, your design skills or your planning skills in a way that actually really helps to improve community. And it's not about me being a leader, but really be, being more about a voice and being able to get in the rooms that other people can in, can't get into to tell what their issues are and then bring those forward and then actually to create action and deliver projects based on those. This is just more information about this. So the thing interesting about that one is that the United States is the only member of the UN that has not signed off on the Child Friendly Cities Initiative. Yet we talk about how wonderful we work with our kids and we have our great educational system, we engage them. That's a complete diff problem there, right? We're, we're not even at the same level as the Western world in considering our young people as people that are actually important. So, you know, this is a great quote that talks about the reason why it's important to do this work. Uh, Dr. Andrew Perry was um, a associate professor, professor at the University of New Orleans. Now he works for Brookings Institute, thinking about how does education really help to enlighten kids and actually be able to engage our larger framework of seeing themselves or being able to understand civic life and, and the role of, of, of being a citizen. And he thought that really one of the things that where New Orleans failed was because there was not enough education about architecture and engineering. And that because there was not enough people in architecture and engineering that represented all people, there were structural system failure that caused particular parts of New Orleans to failed on purpose. And that's why, once again, why it's important to bring young people into this process. And so as we move forward, a lot of people are now are starting to think, you know, can the way that we actually improve communities is really through young people? And so how do we start to do that? You know, and I kind of do it in three different ways. I do it, one, through a planning role and planning lens. And just as you guys have kind of worked out Hunts Point and Bayview, that's where I got my start here in San Francisco 10 years ago working in Y Plan out in Malcolm X, which is really close to where you guys are working on. But two years ago, I had a great opportunity to come up with a project, think about a project for a site I've been looking at for 10 years where Malcolm X is above the project and talking about this derelict site that used to be a very thriving community park and thinking about how do we re-engage students about that. So I embarked on a process of working with, I think, 183 young people and seven different organizations to actually think about how would they want to see this park? How do they want to envision this? How does it actually come back? And you know, in the process of doing that, you know, so we did projects, we did things where we went out to community fairs, we went directly to youth serving organizations, met them in their own spaces. And the interesting thing about this project, I worked from elementary school students all the way up to high school. And in some cases, we worked with them in mixed 
in mixed age groups, which is actually really powerful because it was interesting to see the mentorship that went on between those older generations to the young, younger kids and the ideas that they would actually bring forward of the younger kids. But one of the things that's really important about doing this work with them is in when, even when you're planning, you always have to do something that's based in a model form because that's where they really can start to show their creativity. Drawings are great, you know, doing mapping are great, questions are great, you kind of have to go through that process, but you need to spend the majority of your time really doing model making. Um, and they come up with a lot of great ideas. Then also last year working through Y Plan, uh, had the great opportunity to start working with elementary school students around resiliency. So I'm not sure if you guys were familiar with the resiliency by design challenge that happened like over the last year or two. Um, if not, it was basically as a challenge over for the nine barrier counties looking at identifying one place where um, resiliency was gonna be a major issue. In Oakland, it was around the San Leandro Bay. So the stars where we work with Woodlawn Elementary School students to actually engage them within that process. So we talked really about first thing about kind of what are the issues they already know about what's happening in the community, what do they know about resiliency, and then secondly we started talking about the question about what are the important things that they would want to retain there if the flood does come in there. And then finally thinking about how do we actually start to create a master plan that actually look at about how do we actually deter that in a way that's natural, honors and respects the history and culture that's there, but also allows the communities to thrive economically, socially, and culturally. Um, and then this was a really interesting project as a good friend of mine works within a lot of the restorative justice frame of, of, of work and kind of thinking about how do you use restorative justice to actually change communities. So in Detroit, they have what's called a failed jail. This project was, um, it's a jail site in downtown um, Detroit that has basically a jail that they started nine years ago that's never been finished. So it's been derelict, and they're like spending $20 million a year to do nothing on it. So there was a, a group in Detroit that wanted to think about what if we just actually demolished and got rid of jails, what would happen? So working with five different uh, community organizations that focus on young people, engaging them around the, uh, restorative justice, we created a one-day process for high school students to think about if you repurposed $53 million, what could you actually do around restorative justice instead of a prison? So within and they changed this on the, the night before we were supposed to do it. We were supposed to go from 9 o'clock to 5 o'clock. They told me, no, we're only going from 10 to 3.30. So I had to change the total curriculum that morning to come up with a new process to get this going. But within a day, we basically went through a master planning scenario to come up with, you know, kind of what would they want there. And when we talk about uniqueness of working with young people, the most powerful thing I ever heard of coming to kind of deal with trauma and the things that are happening around, you know, you know issues of of criminalization neighborhoods is one of the students came up with coming up with a mental wellness spa, a place where you can go and heal, a place where you can go and actually connect with community to actually be able to figure out how do I actually heal myself so I actually I can start to heal the community. So these are the ideas that young people bring forward that us older people don't think about because we're too jaded about what we see in community, what we see about government, and what we know about the current set of rules and there's some kind of more images there. So through architecture, you know, it's working in a, a kind of couple different lenses, and most of that work I've really been doing is through the National Organization of Minority Architects, which is a organization that was founded in 1971 by 12 African-American architects, really for the purpose of, of being able to get more projects. Uh, they thought they were being discriminated by race on getting projects, particularly public projects, so they formed an organization to, to be able to coalesce, form, form groups, and to be able to go after projects. But it was also an idea of really being able to be a, um, a connection for youth to be able to understand that this is a pathway that you can move forward to. And so with that process, you know, we have a local chapter here called the S S SF NOMA. You know, we were founded in 1978. And our mission is actually to be activist architects, to be people working out in the community, be that voice of them, working with them to identify how do we actually help them to actually w get what they want in the community versus what actually developers want within their community. And then finally, we have a program called Project Pipeline, where we work with middle school students to teach them about um, architecture and community planning. It's a week-long pro um, process that we do. Um, this is some of the student work that we are, but all our projects that we actually take on are real-based, community-based projects. Like we have a real client, they go to the site, they have to go do interviews on the site or the community around there or with the community partner. You know, 
they actually go out to the site, do site analysis. They run through the, basically the same process you guys do here at school, except they do it in a week. <laughs> um, they come up with amazing pro projects. So, you know, they do, they do drafting, they do model making, they have to do in-house reviews. Um, they also do final presentations out to, you know, upwards, I think the largest crowd is 150 people. Um, but they come up with amazing projects. This year we actually did a, we spent a lot more time doing urban design. This was actually out in Hunter's Point too. Um, and for thinking about what really are ways that community really needs things out there. But like I said, it always has to be a framework of a community voice. We really get them to step back and say, okay, you might have an interest, but what did you hear from the community? Now you can add on to that, but that's where your base always has to start. Um, and then another program I ran for a couple of years over at uh, CCA was a young artist program, which is focusing on working with middle school students. Same thing, another week-long process, but this one we actually did a lot of teaching them how to use digital. So we focus on having to sketch up and we primarily focus on working on residential projects where they had to design sustainable row houses. And then last but not least, design build, which is, which Emily is the expert on. I'm just, I touch a little bit on this. So I've had the pleasure of working with high school students for two years as part of Youth Art Exchange, which is actually a free architecture um, and design build program that's part of, in San Francisco, free for any high school students, um, that they can actually, they go on and learn how to do architecture and design build. Uh, my first year there, the kids decided they saw a lot of homelessness around the site that we work in, which is the south of Mar or actually in the mission. So they wanted to come up with a homeless sleeping pod. So over, the, over a semester of time, they actually came up with designs, did interviews with youth, home, homeless youth to come up kind of what would they want and what would they want to build. So they made a basic prototype and kind of built that. Then the second year, uh, we were tasked to actually coming up. Somebody had stolen Youth Art Exchange public uh, art cart that they would bring out to events to kind of engage community. So the students actually designed a um, full-scale mock-up of an art cart that actually got built the semester after I left. Um, but then the most interesting thing is people don't think, and Cheryl, who's one of my mentors in the front, will talk, they get really love this project, is we actually did design build with elementary school students at Malcolm X. So they built out their own outdoor classroom, which is a really great experience and actually amazing to see these young people be able to actually go right in, dive in, and actually take those materials and move forward to make these things happen. But the real key thing is really thinking about that the most important thing we need to think about young people is that they're not just about assets, but they really are the true agents of change. And so that's the way I want you to think about them, is that those are really the people that we need to push forward because they're the ones that actually have the best ideas and those are the people that need to be, we need to lift up their voice. So, thank you. Good morning. Um, so I always love sharing a stage with my friend Prescott. I love, um, I love the work that he does, and I think the work that we do um, collectively is really complimentary. So I'm just going to show, I'm going to start a timer also. I'm going to talk quickly because I want to get to all of your great questions. Um, so Prescott started with his childhood. I'm going to do the same. Um, so these are my two grandmothers, and my mother is Chinese and my father is French. So this is my Chinese grandmother and my French grandmother. Um, I'm showing them because I think these are the first people that I, that told me that I was creative and that I had something to contribute through my creativity, that there was a type of voice um, in making that didn't exist in other parts of my life. So my grandmother on the left is, um, or was, both of them have since passed, uh, was a epic musician. She's holding this saw that she used to play as a musical instrument. She was also a ballerina. She was a champion race walker. Um, she made the best dumplings on the planet. Um, she was a soprano, like just everything all the time, like always creating something. Um, and my grandmother on the right was also like, uh, well, they were both librarians, but my grandmother on the right was much more sort of meticulous and technical. Would do these like crazy intricate cross stitch and needlepoint projects, and so I just grew up grew up around these women who were both immigrants to this country and who were both constantly producing stuff. And so I just grew up with that as a model of like what a strong woman looked like. Um, I also had some incredible teachers, so I, I can. I can trace back almost the exact day of when I decided I wanted to study architecture, and it's because of these people. So this is my econ, uh, calculus, and environmental science teacher. 
And I was like that kid in high school. You probably would have hated me if you'd known me in high school. I was like the founder of the Calculus Club, and I started the Habitat for Humanity chapter, and I played varsity soccer. I was like that girl. Um, and it was really hard. Like when people start asking you, what are you going to study in college, and you're like 16 years old, and maybe some of you knew that, but I didn't. And because I wanted to do all the things all the time. And that doesn't really play well when you have to check a box on a college application. Um, so these three people, these high school teachers of mine, were the first people to tell me it's okay to be a nerd and it's okay to be a nerd about everything. Like it's okay that you're interested in all these different things. Something will emerge that will capture your, your learning and curiosity. Um, so after that summer when, I, when my teachers told me that, I was able to travel down to Central America with this um, group of other teenagers from around the country, and I learned how to build. So this was a service trip. It was almost three months. It was the entire summer. And I spent weeks and weeks and weeks, like, hand mixing concrete, cutting rebar with, like, a 20-year-old hacksaw, um, using a machete to cut down a field of weeds, pouring concrete, framing this roof. And like this is the most transformative moment in my entire life. This is the moment I realized like not only do I want to study architecture, but I want to study architecture because it's the way that I feel like I have meaning in the, in the world. Um, that all of the creative voice that my grandmothers had modeled, like this is what that meant for me. Um, it, it gave me permission to make stuff with my hands and to connect that to like an impact in the world. So I'm just going to show four projects super fast. Um, happy to talk more about any of them. So this all sort of manifested over many years of going to school, um, trying to be a good adult, like trying to get a good job with a 401k and a salary and a cubicle. And it turns out I'm very bad at that. I'm also very bad at working for a boss. Um, I'm very bad at doing work that I did and then letting someone else put their name on it. Like that's horrible. I hate that. So started a nonprofit in 2008. Um, when I was 26 years old and um, did not know what I was doing, but wanted, I really wanted architecture to feel like this and not like conference room B, meeting at 2 o'clock about doorknobs. Like, no. So um, I started a, pro a, a nonprofit called Project H and did not know what I wanted it to be, but I knew two things. I knew that I wanted to be able to do work that was hands-on, and I don't mean facilitate that work. I don't mean like, let me set up this project and then watch people build it. I mean like, I need to have my hands on tools. I know that about myself. Um, I also wanted to do this work with young people. And it's because of this moment, because I knew I had experienced what it felt like as a young person to use design and building as a way of like forming my identity. I knew what that felt like. Um, and so. I'm making a long story very short, but about two years into um, Project H's existence, I was invited by a superintendent in rural North Carolina to move, move down there um, and work with this school district that was on the brink of collapse. It had the worst um, graduation rates in the state. So many of the students were reading at like a fifth grade level, like all the things that we hear about the worst public education systems unfortunately were true in this place. And so when I got down there, I did some work, I, we built some projects, and then I realized, no, this actually has to be in the classroom. Like, this has to be a thing that kids are experiencing. Um, and so the result of that was a design build class that I ended up teaching um, for two years to high school juniors. I'd never taught high school before. I'd never worked with kids from the South who were reading at a fifth grade level before. Um, but I knew that I could, and the first promise I made them was that I will always be here for you. Kids always know who shows up for them, and they always know who's faking it. So that was my promise. And over the course of the first year, um, we built, well, this, these are, this should look familiar. This might look like your studio desk, like hundreds and hundreds of models. Um, we built chicken coops that we gave away to um, local residents who put them in their backyard. And then we designed and built a farmer's market for the town this is a town of 1,500 people. There's no farmer's market for 85 miles, and yet there's like a huge historical farming legacy. Um, also really high obesity rates and not very much economic opportunity. So this makes sense on a lot of levels. Um, this is a model that was like sort of the mishmashing of like many junior year high school students' ideas pushed into one idea. Um, and then, then they actually built it over the summer. So like the school year ends in June, and they spent two months 
building this thing that started as a model on their desk. Um, and this is the final building. So this is a building that was 100% designed and built by 16 and 17 year olds. I take no credit for this idea or its execution. Like yes, I helped build it, but I don't call this my design. So this was the proof for me that not only were kids, I use that term loosely, youth, young people, incredibly underestimated, but also that they could and should be the leaders in their own cities. This is exactly what Prescott was saying about the, was it 34%? Yeah, so this is an aging community. I'm sure that percentage is a little bit smaller, but in places like rural North Carolina, there's this thing called the brain drain, right? Where kids that are the most successful leave and don't come back. So you're left with this disconnect between kids not being invested in the town and adults not believing in them and it's just this vicious cycle. So in this case, you have kids not only who've contributed something to their town, but also who now believe in their town as a place that they're proud of and may also come back. And you have adults who are looking at kids in a totally different way as people who are capable of this. Um, so then, second story is that after being in North Carolina for a total of three years, um, that program, that Studio H design build program, um, we brought it back here to the Bay Area to a charter school in um, Berkeley called Realm Charter School. Total, complete opposite of North Carolina, like in all ways, right? Um, but in many ways, this is not totally true, but in many ways, young people are very much the same, no matter where you are. That's, that maps differently over race and gender and geography, but there are fundamental things that like all young people need. Um, and so we thought about how to do this work in a more urban environment where our students were um, almost three quarters uh, English language learners, many new immigrant students, um, many students who had special education needs. So like what does that look like with a different group of students? And so this was one of the first projects we did where this is actually an eighth grade group that was very upset that their charter school did not have a library. There was a building where there was a room that had been um, tagged to be a library and then it was never built out as a library. So they were like, where's our library? We want our library. And so we built the library. Um, we built these like 600 of these X-shaped shelves. They all lock together in really cool ways. Um, it's a little tricky to see, but there's like a shelf over here and there's a shelf over there. The coolest part of these, about these shelves is that they're infinitely flexible. So like you could go in there one day and the shelves look like this and then you could go in there the next day and some kid decided they needed a comic book shelf and built it. So this is also, this is not just about kids saying we want the space and we're going to build it. It's also about like listening to how youth are redefining the types of spaces that we have come to understand. Like when we all think of a library, we think of like a very quiet, sterile space, Dewey Decimal, whatever, like everything's coded, it's a place of reference. And these eighth graders thought about it as a place of like play and experimentation. So that was like such an enlightening thing for the school to then be thinking about how better to serve kids. Um, oh, what am I pressing? The wrong button. Okay. Um, so then following this, the library project, we began exploring the, the very um, urgent issue of homelessness in the East Bay. And many of my students some of my students have previously identified as homeless or um, have been in foster care or live in very, very small, poorly maintained housing conditions with like three, four generations of the family packed into a one bedroom house. So the idea of housing and home was really personal to them. Like they felt like, what does home feel like to you? Many of them were also recent immigrants. So the idea of home is not just about safety, it's also about displacement. Um, so we began thinking about homelessness through the lens, through a lens that was also very personal. And I think this is something that young people do really well. They're able to make big, big, big ideas very, very personal, um, which is often like the best way to understand them. Um, and so these are some of the models. We, we designed and built two tiny homes um, that were then given. Uh, one was donated to a transitional housing facility in Oregon. The other was um, given to a single mother um, and her daughter. Um, so like physically built these things and these are the two homes that are like mirror images of each other. So I love this project so much because it began to give permission to students to bring their own, like what they thought of as their baggage, actually as like a really, really important part of the design process. That a lot of things that young people identify as their traumas are actually 
like really, really rich and incredible ways of, of changing the way you interact with the world. So I think it's also important when working with young people to try to flip their own story from like a, a place of acknowledging that yes, there is legitimate trauma, but also like giving permission to tell that story and make it into something um, productive that will truly be healing. Um, then the last thing I want to show really quickly is that uh, this is the project I spend the most time working on. This is a physical place in West Berkeley called Girls Garage. Some of my UC Berkeley students who are here have been there. Um, this is a space that I, I created this program um, six years ago, and I opened this space three years ago. And this is like a physical place. It's only for girls. It's for girls ages 9 to 17. And they come after school and over the summer, and they learn carpentry, welding, architecture, screen printing, lock picking, all kinds of cool stuff. And this was a really important thing for me to, um, to come to understand, too, that like we all identify in certain ways. Um, whether or not we are like part of affinity groups or not, we all have things about us that feel that we're either like ashamed of or that bring us like uh, daily challenges. And so this was my way of saying to young girls, in much in the way I experienced it, that this is a place that's safe, it's a place you can be brave, it's a place where there's going to be no bullshit. Like if you want to, if you're nine and you want to learn how to weld, I'm going to teach you how to weld, like the end. Um, and so that, this is, um, this is me teaching a young girl how to weld. So I think that there's also part of the, the exciting work with young people is getting to also like create spaces in which they can be their biggest selves. Um, so this is MIG welding. Um, we also do work for local clients. This is a shelving system we built for the um, women's shelter nearby. Um, it's also connecting like your own bravery to the needs of others, like that we, our skills can be in service of something else. Um, and then this is a greenhouse that we built for a, it's not done, this is an in progress shot, um, but some teen girls that built this for a local um, community garden. So this is like, to me, this is sort of the culmination. This feels very much to me like that very first photo I showed you where I'm like covered in paint and um, working in Belize. And so I think like for all of us, what's most exciting to me about talking to this group is that you all are not, you're closer to your childhood than I am. And I think that it's such an important point for you to be asking the questions of yourself, like how do you want to engage with youth? Um, what are the things about you that are true that you can share? Um, and what are the things about you that you like feel some vulnerability around? And like that's also a point of connection. Um, and because we're all designers and builders in the room, there is like this very physical manifestation of the way in which we do that work that is so exciting. I'm so glad you're doing this work. Um, and I just want to end with this. This is I've, this girl, Erica Chu, has been with me since she was 10. She's I think she just turned 17. Like I've known her almost her entire life. She was a photographer at my wedding. Like this is the closeness I feel for these girls. Um, and she said this when she first learned how to weld and now she's like applying to schools to become a structural engineer. So this feeling matters to me. I feel like this is the goal. This is the goal of our work um, in doing design, build, architecture, um, creative work with young people. Oh, with one second to spare. Okay, thank you. Thank you both, um, both fantastic presentations. I'm going to be asking um, a couple of questions that are framed from our second year and fifth year undergraduate students um, who are all very um, super excited to have you here today and, and excited about what you do. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the start of your businesses, I say plural because there seem to be uh, many. Um, and that you both exude an, an enthusiasm for working with youth. And our students wanted to know where did that initial passion for working with youth specifically start? Oh, I have a short answer. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi. Um, my answer is short. It came from that feeling that I had as a young person um, learning how to build. And I think that's a feeling that we often lose, lose track of as, as grown-ups. Um, in fact, I bet if everyone in here like just thought for a second about why they came into architecture or design, like my guess is the vast majority of you could point to a couple moments from your childhood. Um, so that's all to say like childhood matters. And I think for me it was, it was having a couple key experiences that like just gave me a glimpse into what it could mean to live a, a whole life doing that work. 
Um, mine was really, like I said before, is from my, my family, first and foremost, but having that early exposure in college of actually working with young people through City Vision was just change the dynamics of thinking about one, how do I work, but more importantly, kind of how does other people think about community and young people think about community. So it was really that program of working with City Vision, which they actually celebrated their 20th anniversary. Um, so it's really that work of just doing the work with young people it was really amazing to experience that and see their growth, but more importantly, how much they influenced me too. Great, thank you. Um, sticking with the success of your businesses, what have been the key aspects to that success? And what are or were some of the surprise challenges? Um, <laughs> this is a lightning round. Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, my nonprofit is 11 and a half years old. Every single day I'm hustling. That's what you have to do when you run a nonprofit. So I think the biggest, my answer is the same. The successes and the challenges have all come from um, taking responsibility for a thing, a legal entity that my name is on and committing to doing it for 11 and a half years, I hope d decades more, um, that really like the work is so, you just have to be all in. You have to like be doing your accounting and your publicity and like teaching kids all at the same time. So this may not be true for all of you, but I think that was a really important lesson for me to understand that all of the good things and all of the bad, not bad, all of the challenging things um, we're sort of all the same, and that's what we signed up for. Like, this work doesn't get easier, and that's the point. Um, it, it will always be hard, and it will always be incredibly fulfilling, and that's, I think that's why we do it. I think for me, because I just recently started my own business, and actually a lot of the work I've done has really been acting as a consultant. It's been pretty easy for me, to be quite honest with you. Um, but I think that the difficulties really come down to, you know, talking to people and getting them to think about the value of really working with young people. I mean, I think that's why the work with Y-Plan's been great because they're the constant advocate, um, but it's really getting to adults to actually get them to understand what the real value of this work is, and more importantly now, trying to work with governments to actually understand that as part of their process, they need to work with young people. If they want great cities, they have to have young people engage with that process. And I think the most rewarding thing that I've experienced is really seeing the students that we've, that we've had, particularly through Pipeline, that are now actually in architecture school and are actually now coming back and actually starting to run Pipeline is amazing to see that it actually works. And more importantly, that they are becoming the leaders of the programs and I can phase out. We hope not. <laughs> um, Let's see, our next question is, how have your community projects, or how do your community projects come into being? In other words, how do they get started and how do they get funded? Yeah, I, so I think we're like an anomaly in this way. Someone recently was like, what's your hit rate? I'd never heard this term before. I was like, I don't know what that is. And there's, this person was like, oh, it's the percentage of projects you end up doing that you submit an RFP or you go up for. And I was like, what? I don't, I get 100%? Like, we only do projects we know we can do. So I think the community, um, yeah, th again, this is like not a standard model. But what we, what we do is we, um, we have 12 after school classes per year and six weeks of summer. And every week of summer, we have a project that we start on Monday and we finish on Friday. And on Friday, we deliver the thing, the greenhouse, the, um, the shelves to the women's shelter, the fruit stand to the refugee serving organization, um, we deliver it. And so girls go through that process in a week. And so that means, to your question, the projects have to be um, pretty well scripted ahead of time. Like I have to know who the client is, I have to know they're gonna come on Monday and talk about their organization, and I have to know there's gonna be someone there on Friday to accept the greenhouse. So in that way, it's like very different than most architecture or construction projects where you're sort of like at the behest of all these different parties. Um, it also goes very fast, but I think because young people are involved, like we owe them that finish line. Like if I say we're building a greenhouse, on Friday there's gonna be a greenhouse. Um, so I, yeah, there, we try to look for community partners and clients who um, will give us enough latitude that if we want to paint the greenhouse blue, they're not going to have a fit about it. 
Um, but also people that have like the same kind of heart and soul and commitment to a community. Um, like the women's shelter is our longest standing partner. And every year we say, what do you need? And they say, we need these five things. Um, and they, they give us like just enough to, to allow the girls to understand the work and ask questions. But then they also kind of like give us our space to build the thing. So I think those are the things we look for in a client. Um, almost all of our stuff is, our, of our work is funded through a combination of um, grants and individual donors and some amount of like corporate either in-kind or, um, or cash donations. So it's, this is what I mean about hustling. Like this is a different model, financial model of work. So you're always, you're asking for someone um, to contribute something when they're not actually the beneficiary. So you, you have to find ways to talk about the work um, where the value is clear for different types of people, to a foundation, to um, Ryobi, because I need them to give us tools, um, to the kid, to the parent, to the community client. Um, so a lot of it, I think, is about storytelling as well. Mm -hmm. It's about hustling. Um, because I've kind of worked in three different sectors of you know being a consultant, one, trying to create projects, and two, kind of cultivating them more from a, a professional organizational-wise, it's a lot of, of talking, communicating, building relationships and partnerships. Um, through Y Plan, it's easy because you know they're UC Berkeley Center for Cities and Schools, so they they're always out there hustling, looking for for projects, looking for funding. So for that one, it's kind of easy. They're like, oh, we've got a project, we've got some money, we'd like you to come work with us. Easy on that one. My work through A and D was extremely challenging because even though we were a nonprofit community-based design organization. You know, a lot of people didn't want to hear this. They're, what, you want to engage young people in the process? What is this? They're like, we just need stuff built or we need stuff planned. So over my time there, you know, spending a lot of time within the Mayor's Office of Community Housing and Development and the Planning Department, I just kept talking about this, talking about this, talking about this. And when I would see grants come up, I would skew the grant in a direction that I wanted. And they're kind of like, this is not what we're looking for. I'm like, listen, I meet all the criteria that you guys want. We've never done something like this. Why don't you let me be the prototype? So if I screw it up, everything can get blamed on me, and now all the credit can go back to you. And a lot of times they like that, because a lot of times they want somebody that they can blame, and I'm fine with that. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. I mean, the end of the day that matters is that we're actually engaging young people. So it's a lot of times figuring out how do you change the structure to work the way that it wants to work for you. Um, and then with, particularly with Pipeline, that's leveraging a lot of my connections when I was still working in practice. Um, you know, I made sure always to connect with a lot of the firm owners, principals, and that's why I also did a lot of professional organization volunteer work. And so I can go to firms and be like, hey, you guys talk about that you really want to um, improve diversity and inclusion. Here you go, I got a program in there, so this is how much money I want out of you. If you can't give me money, give me supplies. If you can't give me supplies, give me mentors to come work with me. You know, so it's really about cultivating those relationships over a long term and also making sure that you're not just doing this to say that I'm only my, I'm getting benefit out of or only kids. It's a partnership and that's critical to, of creating long term partnerships. Um, what else was I supposed to talk about? Well, you talked a lot about getting, getting it funded. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's hustling and like I said, working in the nonprofit world like Emily had mentioned too, that's a constant fight for finding funding. Um, and that getting into it, I didn't realize I was gonna have to be the fund developer too, but that's kind of the process. Um, and something you always have to learn how to do. I want to just add one thing. I mean, I think one of the really, it is incredibly hard to be constantly fundraising, but the, one of the w really wonderful things about working with young people is that when you go and you say, hey, we're doing this program, we need donors, there's like a process of self-selection. Like the people who donate to you immediately believe in you. You have like this inner circle of cheerleaders automatically. This is like very different than running a company where you're like selling a product and the person might hate it and like write a bad Amazon review. Like the people that donate to your work are like your 
best supporters. And so that's, that like is really um, rejuvenating to me that like even though it sucks to always be asking for money, the people that say yes, you're like, okay, I have a community now. Like these are the people. And then connecting the donors to the youth as well. Like these are the young people who's, uh, who's the programming that you made possible. Um, so it feels like kind of icky sometimes, but also like the, the relationship that is created from doing that work is like, uh, yeah, invaluable. I am very comfortable for asking money for people now, especially large corporations because they have plenty of it and it's usually not served for the best interest of the public. Yeah, if you ever find yourself in a fundraising position, ask for 10 times more than you actually need. <laughs> Good advice. Okay, I'm gonna turn a couple of our questions to the specific uh, youth engagement that you do. Um, how many youth do you think you've worked with over the years? Big Eight, numbers, 1800. I 1800. Okay. I think that's actually pretty accurate, yeah. I'd probably say it's definitely over 1,000. Yeah. yeah. All right, and how does the process of your youth outreach start? Um, for me, it starts with, like I said, it always goes back to community organizations. Um, I first and foremost always start looking for organizations that are already cultivating working with youth. Um, that have an invested um, long-term on youth because that's really what anything I'm doing, it's a long-term investment. Um, and it, if they're not invested in it, then it's, not, it's never gonna work out. Um, the other one is like, I'm always out in different events and you know, if I see any, any person, young person, adult organization that, that I possibly think they might be interested in, I'm in their ear, like, okay, let's meet for coffee. Let's, can I talk on the phone? Let's, you know, let's meet up and figure out just different ways to do that because I think once people understand the value of this, they're on board. But the problem is, is convincing them that it actually is a value a lot of times. Yeah, for me, actually, uh, so I'll say two things. One is that the very first um, girls' garage camp I ever ran, I put up 10 posters and I haven't advertised since because parents and kids tell each other about stuff and they just keep coming. And now I have a wait list of 150 people that I have to deal with, which is a good problem. Um, that, but, but there is, like, I think community organizing 101 is like you don't expect people to come to you, you go to where they already are. So maybe that means churches, maybe that means elementary schools, maybe that means like the guidance counselor's office. Um, you have to do the work to get them to come to you. And, and you also have to like be on, on other people's turf. Like even though you're trying to get them to come to your turf, like you have to sort of learn how to be in places that maybe you wouldn't otherwise be. And uh, that's a real skill to be able to like code switch in that way, in a way that's like sensitive and inviting. Um, I also think this starts with brand and messaging. Like there are some, there are some organizations that, I, that are serving youth where I just like look at their branding and I'm like, oh my God, like, like I, I don't know. There, I think there are some that are very um, insulting to kids and others that are uh, kind of like blind to some of the racial or gender implications of branding like small things, like color and typefaces, and um, don't make your logo look like graffiti if you're serving, uh, that's just like, stop. Um, I, so I think some of it is also that. It's like we, uh, spaces, stories, visuals, like com communicate to all of us subconsciously whether or not we belong. Um, so I think especially if we're talking about youth that, that do really need an invitation and the permission to be there because maybe they don't think this is for them, um, being sensitive to like every word and every image that's associated with your work um, is sort of like a subliminal way of, of recruiting kids as well. I, I also wanted to add on that, that we, I do have a very specific focus. It's first and foremost on, on, on black kids, but then, then secondary is minority. So that's first and foremost who I'm looking at is because if you look at the statistics around who becomes licensed, who's in the planning realm, the, the lowest common denominator usually is gonna come down to black women. So that's where I really start. I look for organizations that focus on, have a focus on, on black women, and then if I get those, I can get everything else. Okay, great. I'm gonna run a little bit longer than our time frame, just because, again, I have so many great questions here. Um, so you both mentioned in different ways about your youth, your students, uh, being underestimated by their communities or by society at large. 
So this is a two-part question. First, what is your core message to them? And second, what are some of the methods for promoting creativity as well as design authority uh, with that youth? Um, the, can you say what? Can you rephrase that? The core message. The yeah, question? the first question was, what's the core message to the youth that you've identified or feel you know understand are underestimated by their community and society? Yeah, yeah. I think I mean so much of the external messaging, whether it's to young girls or um, young kids of color or whoever you want to put in this bucket of uh, underestimated kids. I think the message is like that's. BS, like you're being fed a false image. That's just not true. And so part of the reason I, I wanted Girls Garage in particular to be a physical place is because, I mean, as architects and aspiring architects, we all know this, like there's power in space. And I think the space communicates that message too, that you're here and you're of value and this is your place. And everything else that the world is telling you that makes you feel bad, you're not going to experience here. Um, so I think a lot of it is sort of like an undoing of what has already been told to them. Um, Specifically for young girls, I also think it's about, like I don't ever push the message, like if you come to a girl's garage, I'm gonna turn you into an architect or an engineer, like that's not the point. If There are many girls that do, but to me it's much more about like building your own creative confidence and then finding the way that's meaningful to you to apply that in your life. And so that might mean engineering, it might also mean med school. Um, so there is both like a, a a message about confidence and invitation, and also that like whatever you bring into this space, there's a place. There's a place for it. And I, I didn't hear, what was the second part? The, sorry. The part was about promoting their. Sorry, promoting their creativity and giving them uh, a voice and design authority around that. Yeah, so. I don't, I actually don't think that. I've never had to push a girl to be creative. I think that they are. I think they come, to our organization because they already have that rumbling and they just need the place to do it. So I think uh, it's very similar to Emily. I think the thing that we want to do first and foremost is create a safe space for them to be goofy, be crazy, be exactly who they are. I mean, that's how you're going to be successful in life. So it's really cultivating exactly who they are and where they are. Um, and then it's, also extremely important to let them know that we are their allies, advocates, and more importantly, that we're there for them, much as Emily uh, you know, spoke, that we create a place that is open for them. Um, and that's very important to make sure that they feel like it's a safe space um, and that their ideas are they bring forward. Our job is really to support and help them to be able to get those ideas out there and to make sure that when they present them, that adults can understand them. So, you know, it's not important as, to me to really to create a whole legion of architects or planners. It's really going back to this idea of spatial activists. People understand, you know, what their community is, how it operates, but more importantly, that they birth the ideas and, and the direction of how it should be built. So that's the most important thing that we really do, and that's kind of the fundamental pedagogy that I work across you know, architecture, planning, design, build, is really cultivating that idea that you can be in charge, and that's also getting back to the same idea of, of agency, um, is that, you know, your ideas are just as valid as anybody else, and a lot of times and more valuable, because when we go back to the public realm, think about who uses the public realm the most, it's usually people under 18 and people over 65, people we don't engage the most. So, you know, we're just building on the skills they already have there, giving them a new set of tools to really be able to communicate, like I said, most importantly with adults, to let them know that, hey, listen, we've got great ideas, um, and here I've got a really straight process of how I came up with the issue, more importantly, how I came to the solution, how I vetted that solution, and how I can implement that solution. And so that's our pedagogy. It's that simple. It's not anything difficult, it's not anything complex. It's just about building them up as who they are and allowing them to shine exactly as who they are. That's great. I'm going to ask one more question, then uh, turn it over to Q&A, and we'll come back if we have more time. Um, so, you've, Emily, you mentioned kids always know who shows up for them, and I think that's what you both were touching on just now and developing that trust and, uh, and that the creativity is sort of already 
there and it's sort of helping bring that out and so the next step would be how would how do you help those students or youth communicate their ideas to the community at large yeah I mean there's some obviously there's like very specific things like a lot of people are nervous to speak in public so sometimes we'll do um, like quick tutorials and coaching on like how do you when you stand in front of an audience like don't face the board and talk to the board but like really like these are fundamental things those are the easy things to teach um, I think that um, more for young people it really like and as I'm thinking especially of my of my young girls a lot of it is just straight up confidence like saying to a girl like you are the expert of this project not your parent not me you so we we need to hear from you like we can't hear the story of this project from anybody else so you have to be the one to tell it and that's like so it's a little bit of like an expectation and also um, just reminding them that like the, the work truly does belong to them I think it's really hard for people to present other people's work or work that they're just like not into um, but I also think if you've done the design process right and you have young people who who look at work and they're like that's mine I made that model I built that chicken coop then they want to talk about it um, and then you can give them the more specific um, verbal and visual skills but I think so much of it is just confidence and ownership that people always want to talk about their work um, things that they believe in and uh, yeah I think f sometimes um, for my young girls there is there is a there's so much self-censorship that happens so even just something as simple as saying like hey you don't have to be perfect like just get up and tell us the story of your project like that can be enough um, but this also goes to the previous question of like I, I do feel like I know my young people very very well so I know how Micah is gonna be terrified and how Leela is gonna like fidget and so a lot of those things come just with like the intimacy of knowing what every girl needs yeah I mean I personally spend a lot of time uh, focusing on with them about presentation skills um, I was lucky enough to have to start doing public presentations I think when I was in fifth grade because my parents would always say, hey, you need to do this, you need to do that, throw me in front of it, in front of things. And the ability specifically for minority students to be able to present at a high level really changes the game for what, how doors will open up for them. So I, we spend a lot of time on that. And we do it in a way of, of where we're, there's certain points we want them to hit on, but it's the same thing, going back to present in your authentic style. You know, if you're fidgety, own that fidgety. You know, move around, do it, do it with, some, do it with some pizzazz. You know, do it. That's that's who you are. So people are like they were fidgety, but you know, they, they, God, presentation was awesome. And so, really building on, like I said, always thinking about what are their skills and assets they already have, and just highlighting and building off of them, um, as well as also working on the areas that they need to do some improvement in. Also fostering an extreme environment of collaboration between themselves, so they challenge each other. Um, in pipeline, sometimes they get heated arguments about kind of what's the best way to design this. And, you know, wh where did you where did you get this? Can you back it up? I mean, it's like they're worse than adults at times of, of that, like how they're digging in on their questions. But I don't think you did that. Where did you? Find it's like okay, we got to back up off you. So you know, instilling that confidence between them as a, as core groups to question each other and not doing it from a, a perspective that I'm trying to belittle you but helping you to get the best project possible so as anybody comes to other questions we've already vetted those questions internally to us and then what was the other question it's about communicating their design ideas to the larger community and so giving them that voice we were talking about yeah i mean it's it's just they they basically have those skills it's just it's just honing them down in a way that they know that allows other people to want to listen to them and once you do that then they suck then they know they got people and then they'll want to talk forever they get that from me. <laughs> Great, thanks. Jen, I'm going to turn it over to you. We have, uh, I have more questions if, <laughs> if we need them. <laughs> so if you have a question, please raise your hand and I will bring the microphone to you. We have one right away. Thank you. I'm going to try not to. Oh, I guess I can do this. So both of you have mentioned about going into the community and to the government and to populations of older people to um, garner support. So how do you convince them of the value and potential of young people? I actually don't believe that people can be convinced. So I don't, I don't ever try to like convince 
uh, that's icky. Like you just feel icky when you're trying to convince someone. Um, but I do think that like this is about being authentic, not trying to sell. Like uh, there's also an ickiness to like putting kids in like your advertising or marketing in a way that feels like slimy, right? So I think it's a balance of like it's just telling the story. And there are times where I will have. Um, young people come with me to talk to like one of our foundation funders or one of our partners and not because I, I am trying to put them in an uncomfortable position but I truly think that sometimes they tell the story better than I ever could. So some of it, there's a couple different levels. One is like I can give you the data. I can tell you like what percentage of young people do I work with who do X, Y, and Z? What percentage of our kids of color? What percentage, percentage return? Whatever. That's that's like the high level data stuff. Some people care about that. Um, but m much more importantly, I think there's, there's like an art to authentic storytelling. And if, if this is your work, like you have to be able to do that yourself. And you also have to have um, enough trust in your relationship with the young people that they are able to do that as well. Um, but this also totally depends who your audience is. Like I would talk very differently to the head of the Chevron Foundation than I would like a middle school down the street that wants us to build them a sandbox. Um, so this is also the nature of the work is that it is so complex so there's no real one right answer. Like you have to just sort of be willing to know who's in front of you and know what's going to be meaningful to them and then still like tell your story authentically. Yeah. Just like Emily said, it really depends on your audience but you know, if I specifically talk about government, um, government is the way is that kind of, I really use the child friendly cities initiative. I talked to him about, you know, that for really talking about inclusivity, really talking about, you know, being able to connect and create spaces that are really about for all, then how can we really be creating communities and spaces for all in the public realm if we're not talking to young people? And once I just kind of frame it that simply, they're kind of like, oh yeah, but you know, then the kind of step back is like, well, we don't have anybody that knows how to do that. That's why I'm here. You know, or that's why I'll bring friends with me that know how to do this work. But, you know, um, you know, I think that the most interesting thing is really is that once you really start talking about it and they reflect on it for a second, they understand the value. So it's not even really about a sales pitch or anything like that. It's just highlighting where there's opportunity to improve and that I'm trying to personally help you improve, but more importantly, once we get the young people on board in the process, they will move it forward and actually will show you how they can improve it. Anyone else? Also, we have an online audience. I'm going to encourage you guys, if you want to type in a question, we will get it to the, to the panelists. Can you talk a little bit more about the, uh, being a spatial activist? And, um, and, and actually what it entails, like different examples. When I think of, you know, kind of over the last really 10 years mark of the way I work and the way I want to work, um, the term of really thinking about architect or planner or designer didn't resonate with me. It didn't talk about the way I work with community, the way I want to continue to work with community, the way I want, I really want to see our profession work. And I'm talking about architecture, planning, design, the built environment realm professions, work with the community. Um, I first and foremost see myself as a, um, a person of service and that my job is to serve my community and that varies from what community I'm in at that time and day. But thinking about that you know, you have people that are housing right activists. You have people that are, are that, that want to do activist activism around, you know, um, sexuality, about income. But nobody really talks about activists within about trying to improve the built environment. And so when I really started thinking about kind of who do I want to be when I grow up, and how do I want to be seen, and more importantly. Who do I want to be around? I started looking at those people and kind of the way they do work. And they first and foremost were always activists. They were working within spaces and places that most people didn't want to talk about, didn't know how to talk about, um, that really dove deep into some historical issues. 
about race, economics, and ownership. And so for me to be able to really say that, I had to be somebody that was comfortable about agitating people and doing that on a constant basis, but not being an agitator in a way that I'm just agitating you, but in agitating in a way that, you know, let's collectively work together to come up with a solution. And working within that framework, that's why I really did talk about having spatial being the part that talks about space and how do we work within that space and then the activist part of being that, listen, I'm gonna either we're gonna, I'm gonna make it happen with you, I'm gonna make it happen with somebody, but someone we're gonna get it done. It may not happen in my lifetime, but we're gonna move it forward and I have to be constant and vigilant about delivering that message all the time. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Hi, um, thank you for your lectures. I really resonate a lot as a person who came to the school, uh, architecture school uh, with personal experiences like that. Um, I was wondering if there is um, any work or focus that you guys do to set up a framework for designers. Um, so I was wondering if, it's, if all these efforts are just for the kids and the communities, their educational uh, you know, opportunities or if there's any potentials of developing this youth invo involvement into larger scale culture of designers, like for other larger scale, uh, larger scale designs, or even smaller scale, you know, object designs, um, if this can be a design culture for designers in, gen in general. Yeah, I have kind of two initial I comments. One is um, a question of scale is so tricky for me. And so like I get asked all the time, like are you, oh, are you gonna like open a girl's garage in every city? And I'm like, no, I'm not. And that this is because as an architect person, I believe so much in context, right? So there's like something uh, like buildings come from context. Some of the greatest solutions come from context. And so um, I think about working with youth as like the ultimate context. And I know earlier I said there are things that are universal about youth, and that's true. But um, I, I don't know. I think that kids deserve a, a, a more like intimate sense of attention that is hard to scale, frankly. Um, I do wish that there were more people doing this work, for sure. And I also wish there were more people coming out of design school becoming teachers. Um, I was just talking, there's a 20-year-old girl who um, is one of our former high school interns, and she is in this welding program right now, and she's just like, I don't know, I don't want to do the whole certification thing, and I was like, Rosie, you should become a teacher. You should become a welding teacher, because who is teaching architecture, CTE? I mean, yeah, it's mostly old white men. So I think if there were like a whole crew of recent <laughs> architecture, design, STEM, builder type graduates who were willing to commit energy to literally being a teacher in a school. Um, it's actually not that hard to do, like certification wise, and the work is so fulfilling, it will teach you so much, even though you are not like an architect in the traditional sense, it will teach you so much about your own creative practice. So I wanna just put that out there, if anyone wants to become a teacher, I'd love to talk to them about it. Um, yeah, but I think that to the scale question, it's always a balance. It's like, we, if you have a good idea, everyone's gonna want it to be elsewhere, but you have to think about like, what are the pieces that truly are scalable and what is gonna lose all its value when it gets replicated? That's like not a very helpful answer, but I think it's, it, it just, it warrants a lot more thought based on the specific program than an easy answer. I mean, I think there's always a certain level of certain aspects that you can implement anywhere, but going back to Emily's point, it really is about context and local connections. Um, I happen to be to done kind of work on both a local level and a national level through Y plan, you know, I've done work within the Bay Area, but also done work in Detroit, and they're completely different contexts. Um, but even then, you know, the whole idea when we were doing work in Detroit was to help to seed some people that had similar mindsets in Detroit to be able to take over that work because that's the way it really should be. I should not be flying around the country to do this work. There should be people like me and Emily in every single city, county, neighborhood that are doing this work. 
Um, and then the same thing with Project Pipeline. Pro Project Pipeline is actually a national initiative of the National Organization of Minority Architects now. It's in their 11th year nationally. Um, here in San Francisco, we're entering our ninth year. And part of that process was actually kind of setting up, you know, this, a, a, a loose framework. Um, and when I was the national chair, I, I was very adamant that I don't want to set it have a, a way to set up that you have to do these things, because everything, like I said, is different in every place. You have different resources, you have different circumstances, you have different opportunities, you have different personnel, um, and so it's important to always go back to contextually. Um, what are the things that really work in that locality, and more importantly, what are the resources you can work with? Um, I think the value is really is what you guys are learning right here now, is that this is something that is a career path for you. Like, I didn't think that this would ever be anything I could make some money off of and pay some of my bills. Um, but that's the difference of where we are now. The idea of you being designers, very loosely planners, that, that, that engaging with the public is something that should be something you do not as part of your job, but as part of a role of who you are as a person and being a good citizen that happens to have design skills. And so it's creating that, as I like to say, me creating an army or working to help to work collaboratively to create an army of spatial activists so this is a normalized thing. You know, we got young people running around just building stuff through cities, you know, making it awesome, making it fun, making it joyful, but also taking ownership. Um, so, um, I think it's just an incredible time that you guys are in of uh, being able to actually start doing this work now from already where you are. Yeah, just really quickly, there's a couple really great programs. Um, there's um, Public Workshop in Philadelphia. There's, yep, there's um, Down City Design in Providence. There's Sawhorse Revolution in Seattle. These are all groups that are doing very, very similar work to us, but the way they do it is like, like Alex in um, Philadelphia is like, Philadelphia like ride or die guy like he's like deep in the city government and if you asked him oh you want to will you move this to Brooklyn he'd be like no why would I do that this is a Philadelphia pro project so that's kind of what I mean like the and those and that's really what makes those projects so great because they're so deeply rooted in the community the community knows them as like an agency that is there for the community but there are so many great examples do you have a last question Mimi as we as I know, we might lose Emily at exactly 12.30. Is that on? No, oh, sorry, guys. Okay, yes, I do have a last question, and that is, um, Prescott, you said earlier that you don't see yourself as a leader, but as a voice. Um, I would disagree, <laughs> and I'm gonna ask you both, how has your leadership or your voice changed over time based on your experiences? I own my truth. Um, like I said, I've, I've really become comfortable agitating others. Um, and not to do it on purpose, but really to get people thinking about, you know, that there's a lot of people that live with a constant agitation. So if you're living with that agitation for an hour, to, how would you think if you have to live that way every single day? Um, and like I said, the, the work I do is very, very deeply personal, but it's really from a, a, a standpoint that I think about that, you know, the best leaders I really see are the people that stand in the background. They're the ones that are organizing, putting things together, and then uplifting people that are around them that they think are ready and capable to becoming the next leadership. Um, and that's where I frame a lot of my work, and that's why I work with young people. I'm, I, I'm really interesting, interested in making sure that particularly in black and brown communities, that there is a strong leadership that takes ownership of their built environment and stops letting outside developers come in and tell them what they need when they already know what exactly what they need, but the developers don't want to listen to them. Um, and so leadership to me is really is, is being in the background as opposed to the foreground. Um, and that's from the leaders I try to model myself at after, that's the way they operate, and I see that's the way that most effectively that things actually get done, is where you're not standing out front, but you're creating a whole bunch of other people that can lead from the front, and you're just mentoring, and mentorship is the key to 
uh, cultivating these processes because it, it needs to be a continuum of mentorship. Yeah, I, I'm gonna, can I just steal your answer? That's, um, yeah, no, I agree with that, all of that. I think the other thing that I've learned is that um, even sometimes when you want to be in the background, you get pushed into the foreground to be like the first person through the fire and you have to be willing to do that. I think um, the, probably the best lesson I've learned in the past two years in particular is that as I had more and more girls coming to my program and I thought, you know, my first role to them is to be a mentor, to help them, you know, learn how to weld, think about whatever, you know, all these things. And then the Kavanaugh hearings happened last fall. I hope you all were watching and maybe enraged. Um, this is last, what, September, October? I could like barely function. I was so angry and um, I went into a girl's garage on this one Monday and it was, a, it was my architecture teen studio and they all walked in and they all just looked like beaten down, like physically just like tired and confused and these are 16 and 17 year olds. So I had this whole plan, we were supposed to draft these plans and I was like, we're not gonna do that, let's make t-shirts. So we made t-shirts and we just like put all of our like rage on these t-shirts and in that moment it occurred to me that also my role as a leader is to like allow for things to happen that might be political, that might be rooted in anger, that might be rooted in like hope and like questions and fears. Like I don't have to have all the answers as the leader but I do have to be willing to like make adjustments to allow my young people to have that space. And so that's that actually, like ever since then, now we have a class called Protest and Print. And girls come and all we do is screen print protest posters. So that's, as a nonprofit, I'm like not supposed to be political, but that's, that's the role as a leader too, is like being willing to make those spaces that feel like kind of uncomfortable, but are so, so important. Um, Cause you have to be thinking about your young people as the future leaders and like, what do they need? Um, that's my role as a leader. Great, thank you both so much um, for sharing your incredible stories and inspiring us today.